Hi everyone, I'm sorry for the delay. I just lost what Charlotte said at the end. So if you can hear me, can someone just give me a thumbs up to let me know I've not lost my connection? We can hear you. Wonderful, thank you. you. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> In which case, sorry, sorry once again for the delay. So I'm really delighted to be here. Um, as Charlotte said, my name's Kat. I'm an education officer and I work primarily in the Trust Teacher Training Programme. So this session is in part based on some of my observations as a former teacher. It's also related to some of what we do when we're working directly with students today. And it's also influenced by my work with teachers who talk a lot about misconceptions they hear in the classroom. So this session is about popular misconceptions about the Holocaust and what we can do about them. So what I'm hoping to do today is to identify some of the most common misconceptions we hear in the classroom, but in wider society as well, to recognise why they are incorrect and to look at the language we can use and approaches we can take to trying to challenge them. So I thought the most important thing to start with is a, dis um, a discussion of what we mean by misconceptions. So I looked up the term misconception in the Cambridge English Dictionary so that I could be certain what I was talking about was really informed by the way in which others might consider that term to be used. So misconception, they say, is an idea which is wrong because it has been based on a failure to understand the situation. So it's um, an idea that's wrong because it's based on a failure to understand a situation. Essentially, it's a genuine mistake, sometimes based on mishearing something, from, uh, jumping to the wrong conclusion, or perhaps demonstrating simplistic ideas. But at the heart of a misconception is generally a good intention. Significantly in this session, we're not going to be talking about Holocaust denial, because Holocaust denial isn't based on misconceptions or lack of understanding. It's not well-intentioned, and rather than being based on not really grasping the facts, it's a manipulation of the truth for political or ideological reasons, usually based on anti-Semitism. So this session isn't about challenging denial, as important as that is, and I know that that's been a feature of lots of discussions that you've had. It's much more about looking at more innocent misunderstandings about the Boyle Bells and 75 activities that you will have encountered challenges to some of your own misconceptions of the Holocaust. And we probably all have misconceptions of different parts of history or the world around us. So we know that it can sometimes be challenging to contradict our own conceptions of the past or the way in which the world works. We've all probably been contradicted publicly and know how difficult it is to change our opinions when faced with someone who um, immediately starts to react um, either aggressively or over assertively to tell us that we're wrong. And I'm certain we can all think about really good powerful teaching experiences when we're in school where we gave an answer that wasn't quite right and our teachers helped us to grasp what it was that wasn't quite correct. And so what I want to do in this session is look at how we can do that when people present us with misconceptions of the Holocaust by challenge them in a useful and helpful way to help them to grasp the ideas in more nuanced terms. So I'm going to share with you a few very briefly why they are incorrect, but more importantly, because as Charlotte said, this is about skill sharing, I want to look at some approaches to challenging each of them. So on the screen now, you can see some common misconceptions of the Holocaust, and we'll, we'll refer to some of these and the ways in which you can usefully challenge them throughout this session. So one common one is that the term Holocaust, or the Holocaust, refers to all victims of Nazi persecution. It's a misconception in the sense that when we talk about the Holocaust, we're talking specifically and exclusively about the genocide of Jewish people. Another misconception that's very common is that Jewish people are monocultural. In other words, there is very little difference between Jewish communities or individuals, regardless of where in the world they live and any of their other ways in which their culture is dependent on their other aspects of their identity. And related to this, a common misconception is that Jewish people were persecuted because they did not have blonde hair or blue eyes. Essentially, suggesting that Jewish people were persecuted because they looked a particular way, which is not true. But similarly, that belief too that Jewish people cannot be blue, uh, blonde, haired and blue eyed is also a misconception, which we'll talk about in this session too. 
A further misconception is that Hitler alone was responsible for the Holocaust, which of course cannot be true. No single individual can be responsible for any series of events of the magnitude of the Holocaust. And this conception that the Holocaust was only perpetrated by German people is also problematic because it removes any responsibility from the majority of people based elsewhere in Europe. The misconception that most Jewish people were murdered in concentration camps also disregards the stories of those who were persecuted in other sites, which we'll also explore today. And the final misconception that we'll challenge today is the idea that most Germans knew nothing about the Holocaust, suggesting perhaps that the Holocaust was conducted, first of all, primarily in Germany, and second of all, that it was conducted in secret, neither of which are true. So these are common misconceptions, often held by young people, but actually reflected in lots of popular discourse too. So it's not only young people who appear to believe in some of these misconceptions of the Holocaust, which is why as well as sharing this session with teachers, I wanted to share it with you because of your work as ambassadors and the ways in which you might encounter similar ideas as you are talking about your role for um, working on behalf of the Trust. So what I want to do is take each of those and share some principles of how we can challenge those misconceptions when we encounter them. Remembering that we've all held misconceptions of different aspects of the past ourselves, and that what we want to do is challenge them in a useful way. So the first common theme in all of this approach is to be direct but reassuring. And in all of the different suggestions I'm going to make, that's really a key thing. That's the most important thing that we can do to help others grasp the nuances of the Holocaust. Remembering that these misconceptions are well-intentioned manipulation of histories. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So what um, does this look like? Well, if we look at one of those misconceptions and how it might materialise in a conversation, we can take this one here. Again, very well intentioned, somebody might say, but Jews weren't the only victims of the Holocaust. It was Roma and Sinti people, gay men, people with disabilities, and many others. Now again, that's based on a misconception, but within that, there's also an attempt at acknowledging the, that others were victims of Nazi persecution, and that those stories are worth telling too. So what we want to do is be direct but reassuring. So um, our response could be, that's actually a really common misconception. In fact, and then we'll follow up. So here we have our direct response, which is saying that this is a misconception, um, but we're reassuring the person who said it by saying it's really common. In other words, lots of people think that it's not just you, and so don't feel on the spot that I'm challenging this. Rather, we're going to present alternatives which are more factual. So we're using a response that's actually a really common misconception, in fact, to be direct but reassuring. And then we go on to give examples. So here is the definition of the Holocaust, which might look very slightly different to the one that you pulled apart if you took part in lessons from Auschwitz, but essentially in spirit, it's the same. Because it reads the Holocaust was the murder of approximately 6 million Jewish men, women and children, by Nazi Germany and its collaborators during the Second World War. So if we want to challenge the misconception that the Holocaust um, is a phrase used to describe the, the persecution of the other minority groups, here's a useful starting point. But of course, if our intention is also to reassure and to engage with that discussion and recognise that that misconception was well-intentioned, we also want to recognise that others were also persecuted. And rather than talking in blanket terms about other groups, we want to bring in, as we have done with the Holocaust, examples of individuals. So the example that I've chosen here is from our Mosaic of Victims of Nazi Persecution resource, which tells the stories of, of individuals from my, uh, other minority groups who also experienced persecution. So this man here um, is Theodore von Ger uh, Michael, and he was born in Berlin in 1925. He's mixed race. His father was uh, black, he was from Cameroon, and his mother was a white German woman. When his father came to Germany, he could only find work working in a traveling circus style show um, 
where he was performing in some sort of ex as a, an example of someone quite exotic because of his black skin. When Theodore's parents died, Theodore's older siblings left Germany and they moved to France. Theodore stayed in Germany. He left school in 1939, began working in a Berlin hotel, but lost his job after a customer complained about his skin colour. He found it difficult to find other work because he could not, as a mixed race man, join the German Labour Front, which he did manage to find work working in propaganda films produced by the Nazis, in which he played a servant in a variety of films which were celebrating the German colonial period. By 1943, he was uh, conscripted into the German army, but he was rejected and sent to a forced labour camp where he had to produce weapons. But his greatest fear, he later said, was that whilst he was working there, he would fall ill because he had heard stories um, of, of the forced sterilization which were faced by mixed race people particularly. He survived the Second World War, became an actor, a lecturer, a journalist and a political advisor. Now by sharing his story we are reinforcing that the stories of other victims of Nazi persecution are also important but we also can then refer back to our definition of the Holocaust and highlight that the experiences of Jewish people were markedly different as were the experiences of any other minority group. So we're not challenging the person for raising in their explanation of the Holocaust other minority groups but we're making it clear that the Holocaust is the phrase used to describe the experiences of Jewish people but the other stories are equally worth telling. So we are being reassuring but we're being direct. We are highlighting our definition of the Holocaust, we're recognising the stories of others but being really careful with our language. And by doing that we allow whoever has made the misconception apparent um, secure in their own recognition that their answer isn't offensive, it's just historically not correct. If we look at another example of how we can challenge misconceptions, we continue to use those similar principles and we show and tell the speaker what's incorrect about the answer. So for example here we have a further misconception combining two that I shared with you previously that Jewish people were persecuted because they did not have blonde hair and blue eyes. Of course incorrect, Jewish people were not persecuted because of what they looked like, of course they could look like absolutely anything, um, they were persecuted because of who they were perceived to be. So again, we start by being direct but reassuring. Again, many people think that, but really, have a look at this. So again, direct and reassuring. Um, we are contradicting what's being said, but we're doing it in a positive way by again, reassuring that this is not the first time that we've heard this comment. So we can do this, again, by showing and telling. Show showing photographs of Jewish people in a variety of different walks of life and situations. So this particular picture might be what the person who shared that misconception initially envisaged a Jewish person to look like in the 1930s. Gentlemen, often with beards, demonstrating that they were orthodox in what they were wearing, perhaps strikingly different from how many people in their communities would be dressed. Similarly, they might assume Jewish people to look like this, dressed for particular religious activities, this particular boy in Belgium whose name sadly we do not know, dressed and posing for a photograph to commemorate his bar mitzvah. And of course those are Jewish people. But if we really to understand what it meant to be Jewish in the 1930s we need to look at other pictures too and this is where we can start to dispel that misconception. So this is a picture um, uh, of Berta Rosenheim who is a German schoolgirl. She happens to be Jewish but we can tell that she's German because of the cone of sweets that she's holding given to her on her first day of school as part of a German tradition. By showing this photograph we're demonstrating that Jewish people did not necessarily always wear clothing that demonstrated an aspect of their tradition. Berta here looking like absolutely any German child on her first day of school because that in that moment is the most important part of who she is. That is, after all, 
why she's got the sweets and probably why she's got the big grin. But other photographs too can continue to dispel some of the misconceptions about who Jewish people were. So we could share this particular picture of Stephanie, a photograph taken in Vienna in Austria, highlighting that she has blonde hair. And although we can't tell in the photograph she's likely because she's blonde to have blue eyes as well. And just demonstrating that Jewish people can look like those Orthodox men in Krakow, or they could look like, Vienna, like um, Stephanie here in Vienna, helps to demonstrate the diversity of who the Jewish people of Europe were. Similarly, we have other photographs, this picture here of two children, Heinrich and Alice, um, who were Slovak. Um, and those of you who have older siblings or younger siblings can probably remember exactly what Heinrich has probably been told to do, which is grab onto his sister's hand and take care of her when she's in the water. And then this picture too, another picture of children. This is the Murdo, uh, Murdo family in Corfu. Very different um, family setup, very different example of a photograph, but all photographs of Jewish people. And by showing these pictures as a collection, we can challenge the misconception, A, that Jewish people were, multi, uh, were monocultural, and B, that Jewish people didn't have blonde hair and blue eyes, which some people um, think might have saved them. It's a more historically informed idea that Jewish people were not persecuted because of what they looked like, but rather they were persecuted because of who they were perceived to be. Another principle of how to challenge misconceptions rests on the idea of challenging those misconceptions with concrete examples. The Holocaust is so huge, we often have to think about it in quite abstract terms, but it's difficult to use an abstract to challenge a misconception. So we need to challenge them with very specific concrete examples. So for example, another misconception is that most Jewish people were murdered in concentration camps. And again, we'd use a phrase which would help us to unpick that a little by saying, I've heard that before, but... So again, we're reassuring, I've heard that before, it's a common misconception, but let me help to correct it. And this time we could do something slightly different by using examples of maps rather than necessarily personal stories, although we can use those too. So here we have a map of Europe. Um, you might recognise um, those of you who took part in lessons from Auschwitz that the red squares to note the death camps and the red square with all of the lines heading to it is Auschwitz-Birkenau. And we can see the lines showing the routes that people took from all across Europe to be sent to Auschwitz-Birkenau um, where they were ultimately killed. But already we can start to see that these routes are really only on one side of Europe. And if we start to look at other maps, we can see that those concentration camps, which were death camps, the six of them marked in Nazi-occupied Poland, really only do tell part of the story. Because here we have an entirely different set of circumstances. The Soviet Union, after the invasion in 1941, um, mass shootings took place, and we think that, a pro uh, that between a third and a half of all the victims of the Holocaust were shot in mass shooting sites in the Soviet Union. But also, if we are telling stories of the sites beyond concentration camps, we need to recognise the importance of the ghettos. So again, um, if you look on this map, you'll see a series of stars, and each of the stars denotes one of the, uh, one of the ghettos, but there were ghettos across much of Eastern Europe. And we know that hundreds of thousands of people died in the ghettos as a result of neglect and maltreatment. We can't understand the Holocaust without understanding the significance of these different sites. But again, we want to share this in a positive and useful way to challenge that misconception that almost everyone died um, as a result of being sent to a concentration camp. And we can do that in a reassuring way once again by saying, yes, it's a misconception. And particularly with the stories of mass shooting sites in the Soviet Union, but these stories are still only really being explored in, the, the pre, in this generation. For a long time, those are stories that were far less um, pop, uh, well known. And so it wouldn't be unusual for someone not to be familiar with them. Again, um, we challenge a misconception by thinking about concrete examples, and some of those might be the stories of individuals.
So again, if we look at a particular misconception and how it can be challenged, a further misconception is that Hitler alone was responsible for the Holocaust. And as we've said, that of course can't be true because nothing of the magnitude of the Holocaust could be entirely the responsibility of one single person. So again, we want to reassure the challenge. So we'd say it's a little bit more complicated than that, for example. So again, we're reassuring, a bit more complicated. It's essentially what you're saying, but there's more to it. Um, for example, and we'll give an example of a concrete um, story that we could tell. So this is a picture some of you might recognise. This is a picture of Irma and Ursula Klipstein. They were German Jewish people um, who happened to be on holiday in Holland, which is where this photograph was taken. Um, when the war uh, broke out, they were in Belgium. They became refugees and they were hidden um, until they were betrayed by a local family. They then went into hiding elsewhere, with Ursula, the daughter, being hidden by Catholic nuns and her parents being sent to a transit camp. In the transit camp, they were put on the list to be deported to Auschwitz, but the commandant of the transit camp recognised Irma's accent as being from an area of Germany very close to his own, and he decided to take them off the list, saving their lives, because had they been sent to Auschwitz, they would have been killed, possibly with, um, Ursula, uh, with Irma being killed on arrival. So that story might not overtly dispel the myth that Hitler personally was responsible for the Holocaust. But what it does is it highlights that the whole notion of the perpetrator is a lot more complex than saying that this was all done by Hitler. For example, we heard that Ursula's family were betrayed by a local family. Perhaps we can um, conceive of that as an act of collaboration. We've also got the perpetrators who were running the transit camp that Irma and her husband were sent to. And then we have the commandant who really did rescue Irma and her husband by taking them from the transport list, but sent thousands of other people away knowing that they would be killed. And exploring these stories of perpetrators, rescuers, collaborators, and people who might have performed different roles to different people helps us to challenge the notion that the Holocaust was all about Hitler. It also enables us to encourage people to listen more to discussions about the complexities of the Holocaust. And the final suggestion I have for you this afternoon is about being clear about the time and space of any stories that you're telling. That's important because the events of the Holocaust happened in many different ways, in many different places. There was no typical experience of the Holocaust. And so if we look at this example here, that the Holocaust was only perpetrated by German people, again, this reduces the Holocaust geographically, it suggests it just happened in Germany, and it reduces it geopolitically by suggesting that it was only people who had some connection with Nazism themselves who took part in perpetrating what happened. So if we start to look at different stories, we can start to examine why that's not the case. But we need to do so by placing each story in a country and in a year. Again, giving a concrete example to say, well, that's not the case anywhere, but let me show you this example in my case, from Lithuania in 1941. So if we look at this map, you'll see that Lithuania is on the border with Poland, it's just slightly north, and the territory was um, at the times um, uh, part of Polish territory, it's just to the west of the USSR. And I show you that to locate this story in a space, and I'm going to locate it in 1941, the arrival of the Nazis in their invasion of the Soviet Union, which also meant that they took over Lithuania, which was part of the Union at the time. Um, these, this photograph here and this one here are both photographs um, of communities of Jewish people living in Lithuania at the time. This one taken in Kaunas and this one taken in Kosheni. And the people um, in these photographs were the victims of mass shootings which took place on the arrival of Nazis in 1941. 
We think that most of those involved in the shootings were motivated by anti-Soviet um, as well as anti-Semitic attitudes, but most of them were Lithuanian nationalists. So these two groups of people were primarily killed not by people in a Nazi uniform, not by people who spoke German or had any real association with Germany, but rather by people from Lithuania itself. And so if we want to challenge the notion that most of the Holocaust was conducted by German people, we can do so by looking at the story of Lithuania. So I'm going to share with you and leave on the screen while we take questions those common ways of challenging misconceptions. Again, the overarching theme of this is about being direct but reassuring. If people are sharing misconceptions, it's likely because they haven't understood something rather than because they have a particular agenda. So we want to engage them in discussion in a reassuring but direct, by, but the direct way. So reminding them that um, these misconceptions are common, but pointing out to them why they are incorrect. Using concrete examples, which we show to them, introducing different stories and locating those stories in time and space. By doing so, I hope that we can start to correct some of the misconceptions which might, we might hear as we talk to people about the Holocaust.